Historically, across the world, stoneware pottery has been developed after earthenware and before porcelain and has often been used for high quality as well as utilitarian wares. Stoneware, like porcelain, is dense, impermeable and hard enough to resist scratching by a steel point, but it differs from porcelain because it is more opaque. It may be vitreous or semi-vitreous. It is usually coloured grey or brownish because of impurities in the clay used for its manufacture. But white stoneware can be made by using white kaolin in the formula. It seems that the production of stoneware began as far back as the 7th century in China during the Tang Dynasty and quite a lot of stoneware was also made in Korea and Vietnam and a little later in the 12th to the 14th century in Thailand. The forms the quality of the wares and the glazes are quite sophisticated considering that period and in order to produce these wares a very sound working knowledge of kilns, firing and glazing would have to have been acquired. Stoneware is relatively easy to produce. Clays can be naturally occurring or compounded. Early potters would have formulated clay bodies using felspar also called China stone, as the fluxing agent, silica or quartz to promote vitrification and China clay or ball clay as the main ingredient or the backbone. They would have acquired the knowledge of the factors which make a satisfactory clay body such as its plasticity and how easy it is to work in either hand building or on the potter's wheel, which were the two main ways of forming clay in those times. Other factors to take into consideration when making a stoneware clay body are the shrinkage that occurs from the wet clay to the fully fired result and its ability to stand its form in the high firing without slumping the proper degree of vitrification after firing and the glaze fit are also important. Stoneware is fired through a range of temperatures, usually from about 1180 to 1280 degrees centigrade until vitrified, which means that it is glass-like and impervious to liquids. Because stoneware is non-porous, it does not require a glaze, but when a glaze is used, it serves as a purely decorative function. There are four main kinds of glaze. Felspatic glaze, ash glaze, salt glaze and lead glaze. I will talk about glazes in more detail later. Being impervious to liquids was fundamentally the reason why stoneware was such a useful ceramic for storage of liquids. And also, having been fired at such a high temperature, it was also totally resistant to thermal shock. Now let me say something about kilns. Early kiln design varied quite a lot. In China and Asia, the climbing kiln was developed. A series of chambers were built up a slope and as the firing progressed, the pottery in each chamber was fired to its required temperature. This type of kiln was also known as the dragon kiln. You can imagine when the flames were also licking out of the many stoke holes along this long clay tunnel, climbing up the hill and spurting flame and smoke at the other end, it must have appeared like a dragon. This is a diagram of a downdraft wood-fired kiln, which would be a common form of stoneware kiln. Here are some pictures forms of these kilns likely to be seen in Asian countries. Fuel without exception was wood. Reduction firing was easily achieved in this type of kiln. 
In early times, I think that reduction may have come about accidentally rather than by design. A reduction firing is a method of firing stoneware and porcelain where the amount of air intake is restricted to eliminate oxygen in the atmosphere of the kiln to an extent where the metallic oxides in the glazes, particularly iron and copper, convert to their reduced metallic state. The two most notable reduced glazes are the copper red glazes and the celadons. Here we see where iron oxide or ferric oxide is reduced to ferrous oxide by the reduction giving us the celadon glaze, and in this case copper oxide is reduced to cuprous oxide to give us the copper red glazes. Before I go on to show you some examples of stoneware over the ages, I will briefly talk about stoneware glazes in particular. As I mentioned earlier, there are basically four types of glazes used on stoneware, felspathic, ash, salt and lead glaze. Felspathic glaze is composed of essentially the same ingredients as the clay body but in different proportions. This is a basic felspar glaze recipe which I used. The 4321 glaze. Four parts felspar, three parts silica, two parts calcium and one part clay. It fires to a clear transparent glaze. The additions of metal oxides such as iron, cobalt and manganese and chrome and other minerals give it its colour. This brown jug is glazed in a felspathic glaze with about 10% of iron oxide to give it its rich brown colour and fired in oxidising conditions. A very well-known glaze, the celadon, results from the addition of a very small quantity up to about 1 to 2 percent of iron oxide in the glaze which is fired under reduction conditions. The addition of an even lesser amount, about 0.5 percent of copper oxide, to the glaze under re reduction conditions results in a brilliant red glaze. Copper red, rouge flambe, oxblood and peach bloom are some of the names given to it. And you may have also heard of other specialised stoneware glazes found particularly on Chinese wares, both stoneware and porcelain such as the oil spot, hare's fur, tenmaku and chun glaze. It has been the desired aim of most 20th century studio potters to create and perfect these beautiful stoneware glazes. Salt glazing occurs when common salt is introduced to the kiln during the final stages of the firing process. The high temperatures cause the salt to volatilize, depositing it on the surface of the ware to react with the body to form a sodium aluminosilicate glaze. 15th century Rhineland potters found that the technique produced an orange peel-like translucent coating as seen here. Various colors are achieved by a wash of an oxide on the pot before the salt glazing is done. This English salt glaze jug from about 1780 has a very even clear finish and this one is distinctly orange peel. In the 18th and 19th centuries and early 20th centuries, salt glazing was used in the manufacture of domestic pottery. Now, except for use by some studio potters, the process is obsolete. The last large-scale application before its demise in the face of environmental clean air restrictions was in the production of salt-glazed sewer pipes. A salt-glazed kiln can only be used for salt glazing because not only the wares but everything else in the kiln is salt-glazed. You can see here how all the kiln props are also salt-glazed and the pots all stand 
on small pads of clay to prevent them from sticking to the shelves. Ash glazes are ceramic glazes made from the ash of various kinds of wood or straw. Ash glazing began in China after the accidental discovery that the ash from the burning wood was causing the glaze. So they started to add ash to the glaze before the pot went into the kiln. Ash glazes have historically been important in East Asia, especially on Chinese, Korean and Japanese pottery. The ash is prepared and then it is mixed with water and often clay and applied as a paste. A basic recipe would look like this. Wood ash 40%, feldspar 40% and ball clay 20%. Here are some examples of what an ash glaze might look like. The resultant effect and colour of the glaze depends on the varying degrees of the glaze forming minerals in the ash, calcium and potassium carbonates, phosphates and other minerals. Lead glazing was used quite a lot on early English and continental stoneware when they hadn't yet acquired the knowledge of high-fired felspathy glazes. A simple recipe might have been 10% of lead oxide and 90% of ordinary sand. The lead acted as a flux to melt the silica to form the clear glass-like glaze. However, it was later discovered that lead could bleach out of the glaze into the food or liquid, resulting in lead poisoning. So, lead glazing was eventually banned in the pottery industry. This is a typical Staffordshire stoneware teapot with a basic clear lead glaze finish. Now we will have a look at some stoneware pottery and follow its development and progress across the last 15 centuries. I have selected a few images to give you some idea of early Asian stonewares. This lovely Chinese dragon vase is simply splashed with two colours, iron and copper. A Tang Dynasty storage jar with its animalistic handle and spout and splashes of a copper-based glaze. A Tang Dynasty stoneware ewer lightly glazed over a simple cobalt decoration. This one dynasty stoneware flask has a hand incised decoration with a celadon glaze. From Korea comes this celadon glazed 9th century pot with bamboo inspired carved design and a celadon glaze. Also Korean from the same period is this remarkably beautiful modelled incense burner with a reticulated lid and rabbit feet. And this beautifully formed Korean bottle has an interesting crane decoration under its celadon glaze. This unusual Korean stoneware bottle is known as Bunsyong ware, as is this one from Korea about the 15th century. This picture endeavours to illustrate the different colours of the celadon glaze in these two Chinese and Korean bowls. This lovely dish with its incised decoration and elaborate scallop rim comes from Thailand, also in about the 14th century. Here we have a Japanese ash glaze stoneware sake bottle a bit earlier, about the 10th century, and finally from Asia, three beautiful lidded pots from Vietnam, dated between 1225 and 1400. The Chinese, who developed stoneware very early on, classify this, together with porcelain, as high-fired wares. 
In contrast, stonework could only be produced in Europe from the late Middle Ages, as European kilns were less efficient and the right type of clay less common. It remained a specialty of Germany until the Renaissance. Now we will have a brief look at some early European stoneware. A German salt glazed stoneware bottle from the French region, and this one with its interesting applied decoration and splashes of deep cobalt is from Cologne. Decorating pots with a bearded face was very common. Here are four examples of these wonderful bearded faces. They were also known as Bellamine jugs. These rather primitive partially salt glazed stoneware jugs are from the lower Rhine region around about 1400 AD. This jug is from the Westerwald region, another German area renowned for its production of stoneware. Its striking cobalt decoration is under the salt glaze as is also a feature of this much later two-handled stoneware crock pot. The Netherlands also produced a great amount of stoneware, also with the applied decoration, including the bearded face. And this delightful French jug is considerably earlier, about 1650. And we conclude a brief look at European stoneware with this lovely Austrian lidded tankard. The production of commercial stoneware did not begin in the United States until the middle of the 19th century, and then the wares produced were mainly utilitarian salt glazed stoneware, such as these seen here. The underglazed cobalt blue decoration, reminiscent of those seen on German wares, were very popular. This close up shows the free-flowing style of cobalt decoration under the salt glaze. Handled bottles, jugs, lidded urns and the like were produced in proliferation down to a very small but useful item such as this match holder. The decoration here stamped and then enlightened with cobalt. Stoneware in the British Isles made its appearance fairly early in the piece. And here is a very interesting large 16th century unglazed stoneware urn with chunky handles, which has been intriguingly enhanced with impressed lettering. Scratch blue wares were produced in the mid 18th century. This decoration was incised into the pot at its leather hard stage. After bisque firing, cobalt was rubbed into the incisions, the excess sponged off, and then the pot was salt glazed. These four teapots are all stoneware. The Castleford factory was well known for this type of smear glazed stoneware. The pot at the lower left has been decorated by enamels in an extra firing and the one on the lower right is known as redware, a clay body having been coloured by the addition of upwards of 5% iron oxide. You will be familiar with the different types of Wedgwood ware which used the term dry stoneware because no glaze is used in its finished state. The bodies are once again coloured with metal oxides, cobalt, copper and iron and a combination of cobalt, black iron oxide and manganese was used to make the black basalt body seen here at the top right. Wedgwood also produced lead glazed stonewares such as this cabbage leaf teapot here. Many different names were used to describe English stonewares such as granite ware, cane ware, pearl ware, ironstone and in the case of this beautifully reticulated lead setting, cream ware, which were all high fired to stoneware temperatures. The bottom half of this moulded hunting jug from about 1810 is unglazed and the top would be an iron based lead glaze. And here are more examples of lead glazed stoneware vessels 
all without exception produced from moulds and all dating from the early 19th century. Stoneware was useful for other utilitarian pottery storage pots such as these paste pots and cosmetic pots for liquids like these salt glazed ginger beer bottles and more upmarket ones with transfer printed labels and the more elaborate Dalton Lambeth jug with its applied decoration. These two jugs illustrate on glaze enamelled stonewares. And these plates serve to illustrate that stonewares were very suitable to be used as dinnerware in a variety of decorative forms from plain to transfer printed to on glaze enamelling. And these are some of the marks you would expect to find on these wares. Stoneware was particularly suitable for such things as chamber pots and toilet bowls. Before plastics came along, salt glazed sewer pipes and chimney pots were produced in vast quantities. We conclude our stoneware journey with a brief look at stoneware pottery here in Australia. The Bendigo factory in Victoria, which started working about 1850, is a well-known maker of the product, as was the Lithgow pottery, which was active from 1876 to 1945. Both of these factories produced a great variety of salt glazed, lead glazed and felspathic glazed ceramic wares. Here is a delightful teapot from the Bakewell pottery. It is stoneware with a lead glaze from about 1920. And finally, a well-known Australian potter produced these last few pieces. On the left is a large water filter and on the right a stoneware casserole dish. These copper red vases were made in the 70s and this copper red teapot in the 1990s. And finally, a Celadon lidded pot with a carved decoration on the lid. Thank you for watching.